Thanks uh, very much. Uh, thanks very much, Don. Earlier, um, Ian McIver said to me um, that he likes a good chart and uh, he's looking forward to some graphs, so I stuck another 20 or 30 in, Ian, just to make sure that you get a good sleep in. Um, right, so I'll hook through this uh, pretty quick. I've been asked to talk today about uh, protein dynamic changes in Indonesia and, and China, and there's plenty of experts in this room um, on, uh, on that. So if I get any of it wrong, um, don't be afraid to, to sing out. I think the thing that puts you know, so much of Asia in perspective is that there's more people living in this circle than outside of it. This is a bit of a, an old chart, you have know, seen plenty of times before, but it really puts in perspective about where the growth in demand for food is and where the region in the world is that's going to struggle to produce food because there is so many people in, living in this region. We, we break this pie down and, uh, and really break it out into, into the various countries, certainly China and India, uh, you know, the two countries with over a billion uh, in population, it's a pretty big cliff drop off to the 200 million group and then it falls away. But the, the big bit here is so many of the developing nations have got big populations and they're in our region. But I think we, we traditionally look at these markets as countries, but some of these countries are, are so big, they're a collection of multiple countries. And, and as we look at China or Indonesia, India, we you know, often we talk about the country of China, we think about it quite uh, as a you know, very big standard country. They're, they're a collection of countries. The states and the cities in some of these, these countries are bigger than other countries uh, that are actually you know, in the top 30 countries in the world. But another way to look at the world is look at the world in terms of social media groupings and who are the biggest groups of social media and rank that next to countries. So in the top 12, only two are countries. The rest of them are social media organisations. There is more people use Facebook and there is more people use YouTube than live in any other country in the world. In the top 18 countries, as in the top 18, only four are countries. There is more people use Skype in the world than live in Indonesia. Does anyone know what Q, Q zone is. Anyone know what Q zone is? We're on the cutting edge of social media technology in this room. There is 638 million people use this platform. So when we start looking at how do we interact with customers and how do we interact with consumers, it's bigger than looking at it at countries. And this is, I think, as we start to look at how we engage around protein consumption, how we get more people to eat our product, uh, we need to, to look at this uh, as a form. I'm not going to go through all the micro details here. There's 142% usage of mobile phones in Indonesia. So the adult population on average has two phone accounts in Indonesia. There's not many home phones. If you look at uh, social media, that's over 50% over of the population of China is an active social media user, user on a mobile device. So if we start thinking about protein marketing, it's, uh, it's definitely through, uh, through mobile device and through, uh, through social media. Looking at GDP, you know, today, it's uh, 2014 data is a little bit out of date, but China's the biggest, it'll be the biggest in 2030 and be the biggest in 2050. Indonesia, go from number nine up to, uh, up to number four and up to number three. It was quite interesting uh, hearing uh, the, uh, uh, Thomas Lembong speak recently from Indonesia and he said, if our country does absolutely nothing apart from just keep doing what we're doing and every country gets bigger, will still be in the G20. And uh, you know, if you look at our main customers of, uh, in, in, the, in the world, you know, in our live export world, Indonesia is, uh, has got huge potential for growth. You know, in 2011, most of us were, were really caught in the, the live export issue with, with Indonesia. But the other thing that happened in 2011 was world population got bigger than arable land. So we now have more people than we have arable land. Arable land is declining, world population is growing. So if you look at the changes in protein trend, the protein trend is the investment in land. And Jennifer spoke about this before. The amount of capital that is going into land, whether it's into direct protein or into other uh, uh, starches that then go into the feeding of livestock is, uh, is substantial. So the world population expected to go close to 10 billion people by 2050. Um, you know, a lot of investors are looking at land. We break this down a little bit, uh, a little bit further and look at Indonesia. By 2050, 71% of Indonesia's population is expected to live in urban areas. 
as we look at how we transact with Indonesia, how our businesses operate in Indonesia, this really starts to impact how we think about cold storage, how we think about distribution, how we think about trucking cattle off ships, how we think about competing against box beef or working with it. The other thing that has a big impact is, is the change in voting power. So in Indonesia, you know, if you've got the Ag Minister and his votes under your wing and you've got a few other ministers and their votes, you pretty well can, can make it through and get pretty close to winning an election. As, as the, the more population moves into the cities, we've got less voting farmers. The voting farmer block is losing its power and we're seeing that with Indian buffalo at the moment in Indonesia. The, the, the farmers that used to have such powerful votes uh, are really losing that impact in Indonesia and we've got to work out how we, we work around that and engage with that. We're also getting more and more people in leadership positions, not just in Indonesia, but throughout the world that don't understand farming, they don't understand agribusiness, they don't understand the farming supply chain and that's a big challenge for, for all of us in our in industries, but it's also an opportunity if we're proactive and help policy makers and, and leaders understand that. So 2011 was another big impact in China where we saw the urban population and the rural population cross over and uh, you know, very similar issues there with logistics and, uh, and voting and feeding people that are predominantly city-based city but also understanding where your food comes from. Uh, you know, the next slide here is uh, certainly one of Sam's and, and the Life Corp team slide. We've tried to simplify the red meat industry and the supply chain industry to, to help explain what the red meat industry does into Indonesia. It's really complex and it goes back to that thing before of less and less leadership, particularly in Southeast Asia as we move forward, understanding the food chain and the food supply chain. And we've seen that in Indonesia with policy positions like five to one, 350 kilo, uh, taxes and, uh, and also you know, various policy. So being active in policy formulation in, around protein is, is gonna be really important. You know, all of us have, have certainly experienced the, you know, the call from importers saying, you know, we, uh, we need some cattle up here in a couple of days' time. The market's really spiked. Um, can you get me some cattle up here because I need some more meat? Um, and the opposite of that, can you just slow them down a little bit? I don't need them for a couple of months. And, and those, you know, the 120-day cycle in Indonesia is, uh, is certainly a challenge for us. Um, you're looking at emerging markets at income, rising incomes, you know, the exciting thing for me is China, Indonesia, the Philippines and Vietnam are predicted to have a faster growing GDP than the rest of the world. So our main target markets that we have good relationships with now, you know, I know the Philippines is a bit challenged, but our main markets of, uh, you know, certainly China, Indonesia and Vietnam are, uh, are predicted to have good growth. That, uh, that growth over time has continued to grow from a, a predominantly plant-based diet to an animal-based diet and continues, to, uh, to, continues to, to look to grow that way, which is really exciting. So I'm going to rush through some of these to, to get it get done. If we look at lower income uh, versus higher income, as people get more money, history has shown that they spend more on food. So calories per capita per day continues to increase as people get more food, particularly in, uh, in developing nations, particularly in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, you know, those countries, as, as people get more money, they buy more food. The really exciting thing for me is they spend it on beef. And I, I've just put a couple of countries on there just to show where they sit, the US, Japan, Australia. Japan is a bit of an outlier with this older population. But the, you know, the, the markets that we touch of, uh, of China, Vietnam, Indonesia uh, and Malaysia down in that bottom left-hand corner with low GDP per capita also have low beef consumption the global trend for them to, uh, to increase consumption is huge. And certainly outstripping OECD growth. Um, you know, those three countries look, look pretty exciting. Um, Indonesia, um, certainly uh, Greg touched on a lot of Indonesia before and the, and the strength that Jakawi's had from a wobbly start, certainly got into tax reform. Um, Indonesia uh, last year was the, uh, took of, uh, was the, in the region, took more foreign direct investment than any other country in Indonesia. It's quite easy to get foreign capital into Indonesia. It's quite easy to set up a business. Running it can be a challenge, um, but uh, we've certainly seen political uh, challenges there. There's certainly an inwardly looking view on food security, um, and there's gonna be some challenges around that. Uh, you know, Jakawi's prediction that uh, by 2020, he'll have uh, 
uh, inflation back up to 7% is pretty bold, but even if it sits at 5%, it's a much more healthier place to invest than Europe, much more healthier place to invest than, uh, than North America and a lot of other countries around the world. Probably the thing that this doesn't show is what we're seeing at the moment is uh, you know, a softening of consumer confidence um, with some of the instability, uh, with some of the changes around tax, some of the changes around customs regulations that the average consumer just leaving a little bit more money in their pocket. We're seeing some big department stores in Indonesia uh, announce they're going to close, partly due to online retailing and the distribution cheaply by motorbikes um, of, uh, of products from online. And, uh, and we've got to think about that as we, uh, how we target our beef production. Now, the, the rupiah is a big challenge in Indonesia. It's, it's weakening, which is great for food exports and not too good for imports. And with Indonesia you know, focusing on uh, trying to, to be a self-sufficient country for food and not export too much food, when, you, when your currency is cheap, you've got to have regulation to slow exports down. Uh, otherwise, they'll naturally happen, and we're, we're seeing, uh, seeing that. I'll skip over that. Um, you know, here, some work that Deloitte did just uh, in terms of what drives spending decisions, and I appreciate there's a lot of detail in here. For those that don't know, about 93% of beef in Indonesia goes through uh, small uh, wet markets, retail outlets, um, and uh, of beef that's sold uh, through retail. You know, the traffic in Indonesia is bloody difficult. There's a big push to, uh, to use local markets from the government and to continue to improve local markets and uh, you know, more small local markets selling fresh food is, uh, is certainly helpful for our industry, but don't underestimate the investment that's going into cold chain logistics. Much of the food, uh, in meat dishes selling at two to three dollars per meal, the cut is of less of importance, the price is quite important. And we've got to be careful we don't overcomplicate the beef carcass in Indonesia through, uh, through sort of thinking at it through Western eyes, look at the dishes, look at the, t the nat national foods, and make sure that we're helping to uh, invest in capacity around that. Now, the bottom is quite busy. There's a couple of key takeaways from this that price isn't that important as you spread through income. Taste is quite important. Taste is a little bit more important for lower income people. Innovation is more important for higher income people. Pretty, uh, pretty straight, you know, normal things. But local cattle are worth more. There's a trust in local cattle, there's a trust in local beef. Um, you know, this is another busy chart, but basically if you look out to 2050, for all major food types apart from palm oil, Indonesia is going to have to grow imports significantly, particularly in things like fruit and beef um, and even sugar. One of the opportunities for Australia with China and, and Indonesia is the, the difference in our meat processing costs. So meat processing costs in Australia is more than 10 times higher than Indonesia, five times higher than China, two and a half times the US. You know, labour costs are much cheaper, innovation's a lot easier, red tape is, is cheaper, energy's cheaper, and that uh, certainly gives a competitive advantage. The Australian meat processing industry, though, is embracing technology, but I think we'll see those foreign markets embrace that technology just as fast once they, they work it out. Um, often get asked the question about Australian cattle, Indonesian cattle, what's an Indonesian breeder worth, um, and how do we get an Australian breeder? into Indonesia and is it cheaper for them to, to import cattle from Australia or breed their own. Breeding heifers uh, from Australia land in Indonesia, uh, uh, you know, when this were put together, were, were cheaper per, per kilo, more expensive from Brazil and very expensive from the US. You know, Brazil and the US will never, ever, ever get closer to Asia. Their cost to get there is going to be expensive and uh, we've got to take advantage of that. Just moving on to China. You know, Chinese consumption continues to grow. Getting anyone who's tried to get Chinese cattle herd numbers is, you know, it's really challenging. It's quite difficult to know what they are, how heavy they are, and what actually are cattle in the uh, inventory of, of beef and yaks and dairy. But overall, the Chinese herd is declining dramatically, and that's, uh, you know, we've seen that through the pull through from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, and uh, and as far south as Malaysia at times. And uh, their appetite for beef continues to grow. But again. China's just not one market. It's not a steak market or it's not a hot pot market across the whole country. It's a very diverse market. Different regions, different states all have different meat types. And I think we often look through Australian eyes if we either have mince or we have steak and we keep it pretty simple in Australia in these countries. It's, uh, it's quite complicated. So I'm gonna, the next slide is, is a bit of an attempt to, to show one of the things that I think personally will be a challenge in, in China. So if we look here, we've got Sam. This is Sam in China. So Sam gets a wife, 
and I know there was a, the gay marriage issue today and I'm not going to go into that. And this, this, is, uh, this is a little bit controversial because Sam's the only one that earns money. So Sam gets a wife. They have one child. The one child finds a partner. Sam then uh, inherits the family of the partner and their son, Sam number two, becomes the breadwinner for two sets of grandparents and his wife. They think they might have a child, which is a pretty good thing to do. That child finds a partner. We then pick up uh, the next partner. We then pick up the partner's parents. And then we pick up the next child. And we've got one income earner there, potentially. So with people living longer in China, no sort of sophisticated superannuation system, no government-backed superannuation system, I think this could be one of the big challenges for China, is how does a, a flat or declining population that is getting older, that doesn't have a safety net, to cover the cost of itself? I think you know, that's probably the, the challenge. You know, the opportunity here with, um, in, you know, jumping back to just Australia's competitive advantage versus Indonesia and China, to produce 100 kilograms of beef, you know, agri-benchmark uh, report certainly reports that you know, the NT is quite cheap, it's a little bit cheaper than Australia, it's cheaper than Indonesia but not that far, cheaper than China but you know, overall considerably cheaper than all of Europe and, uh, and the US and even parts of South America. So you know, the opportunity for us in Southeast Asia is to grow the pie and not fight over slices of it. There's a massive amount of the population that don't eat beef. We've got to work out how we get engaged with that population how we communicate with them and get them starting to eat beef on a regular basis and how we, uh, how we I believe, grow the, the pie that's eating beef rather than have fighting, fighting over the slices of pie. So, Don, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up and keep moving. Thank you.